Hello. 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 I'm Lainey. I'm Marshall. I'm Corey. And welcome to our very first episode of Can't Fight Nostalgia, where we are going to talk about movies, TV shows, and other things from the 80s and 90s, and uh, we are super excited. Yes. These are a lot of movies that we grew up with, and just, like, make you feel warm inside from, you know, your, ha- your own past. You know, just bring them back. For some of you, this might not be your past. This might be in your history books. We're going to teach you. Or maybe it's from Never Time. You've never seen it. So we will introduce it to you. One thing I will say about this podcast is that this is intended for, uh, under the assumption that you have seen at least the movie that we are discussing or the TV show. Um, That's probably why you clicked on this podcast in the first place. But if you haven't, pause right here and go and watch it. Mm -hmm. And then come back. We will still be here. We're on the internet. That's correct. So today we're going to talk about the 1999 cult classic, The Mummy. This is not the really ancient black and white classic, The Mummy, or the one with Tom Cruise, The Mummy. This is the good one. (laughs) The good one. Yeah, some classic film fans might argue that, but it's, yeah, this one's a lot of fun. So just a little bit about this. Uh, I'm just going to summarize a couple things. So like we said, it is a a movie from 1999. It was released by Universal Pictures. It stars Brendan Fraser, Rachel Weisz, and John Hanna. Those are the three major roles in this movie. There are plenty of other people on here. Uh, The film was based on the 1932 black and white film, uh, which starred Boris Karloff. Uh, this was an ir- intended originally as part of a low-budget film series, but it turned into a blockbuster film. The story basically starts in the year 1290 BC and continues into the 1920s. But when it went uh, to the box office, it earned $415 million worldwide and was followed by a sequel in 2001 named The Mummy Returns. There was also another movie after that called Tomb of the Dragon Soldier. Is that what it's Dragon called? Dragon Emperor, yeah. Dragon Emperor. So there, are, this is pretty big. And if you talk to people right now, they will definitely say that Brendan Fraser is a very beloved actor. Oh, yeah. Right now. Well, in general. <laughs> He's been in a lot of really great heartfelt comedy roles. Uh Back to the past, not back to the past. Um, it was blast to the past, blast, blast to the past, mm-hmm. as well as the the live action George of the Jungle, Encino Man. Yes. yes. Uh huh. I, I love Brendan Fraser. I, I always have. So I was. I'm really excited that this was the first movie we picked. Uh, one thing I do need to tell you is that we have merchandise that we're going to be putting out mm-hmm. for each episode of this podcast. So uh, not only are we going to have some elated geek t-shirts but we are also going to have this time two mummy Mm -hmm. t-shirts that are themed and so if you saw the thumbnail for this episode if you're watching it through the youtube and you saw that thumbnail you really like that thumbnail you can get that as a shirt yes uh if you would like something that's a little bit more cutesy we've got something for you too right so keep an eye on uh, our website and on the show notes because you'll be able to find out more how you can get your hands on them yes So a little bit about uh, the background of this movie. Stephen Summers, who uh, created this movie, wanted to make a funny horror movie. And as he puts it, the hardest thing about the movie was blending the humor and the horror as he didn't set out to make a straight horror movie. And thank goodness that he made... That is what I love about this movie is that there are some kind of gross things in it, but honestly, you don't think about that because the humor is just... It's there, right? Yes. Actually, I felt like this is... It, what they did to make this really work is they injected a lot of the Indiana Jones adventure into the whole feeling of it and then just made jokes the rest of the way. It was mm. It's so good about that. Right. This movie was filmed in Morocco, and while the film had the full support of the Moroccan military, the director added further security measures by taking out kidnapping insurance on the main cast members. Because that's smart. That's a little scary also. 
Yeah. Yes. Well, I mean, we also know that they kind of had to do some of that for uh, the long way up, the long way down, and the long mm-hmm. way around. Right. On those uh, television series, they had to take out insurance. They had to learn how to protect themselves in case they were going to get kidnapped, stuff like that. Those so, shows he's referring to are the Ewan McGregor and his friend Charlie, where they drive motorcycles around the world. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then one last thing that I wanted to talk about here, uh, I was trying to figure out exactly when this happened, but apparently John Hanna broke his wrist during the filming of the movie and had to wear a black cast through the end of the film. Uh, I think they CGI'd a lot of it out because I couldn't really see when it was there. Yeah, I never noticed it. Yeah, but apparently that did happen. All right, so as we're talking about this movie, we're kind of going to talk about it through the scenes. Uh, you're going to notice that Marshall and I did a lot of research into things that were in the background, a lot of the symbology of the movie and where that comes from. But Corey actually listened to the director's commentary. Is that right? Yeah, the director's commentary. So he's got a lot of notes there about things that the director says uh, there. So I tried to listen to Bernard Fraser's commentary, but he whispers the whole time, and it was kind of creepy, so I decided not to. <laughs> and he just needed to have a cup of coffee and sit there and relax himself. That's right. all it was. First thing I think we need to talk about, though, is why is this movie such a cult fave? What are your opinions on that? Uh, Well, like I had said, it's you took the horror, you gave it some Indiana Jones, you give it lots of humor, and it just hits every note that you could want Mm -hmm. in a fun adventure movie. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for a fan like me, I mean, the last Indiana Jones movie before The Crystal Skull, which we didn't know was going to exist, uh, was in 89... So for a film like this to come around, it kind of scratched that itch of wanting mm. more of that kind of Indiana Jones type mm-hmm. of thing. I think, too, that the cast is just fun and solid. Yes. The quotes are great. Um, and it also was pushed out in a time where there were a lot of movies that are solid and that people just wanted to watch over and over again. Um Back then, in the 80s and 90s, there were not as many options as there is today. Uh, You can just stream a movie whenever you wanted to. So I think in that sense, it was a lot more telling when a movie was one of those that you were like, I love this movie, let's keep watching it. Let's Mm -hmm. burn that VHS tape out, you know? (laughs) This movie opens in ancient Thebes, according to the narrator. Uh, The... There is a lot of symbology just in this first scene, so we're going to kind of go through everything we see in this scene. As it pans over, we're going to see a pyramid, we're going to see a sphinx, With its and nose. we're going to see the god Anubis. Yeah, so these are the statues of the god Anubis. He is also known to the Egyptians as Anpu. He is the god of death, afterlife, and tombs, and he's depicted as having the head of an African golden wolf. And a long time, people used to think that it was the head of a jackal until, I guess, they made some sort of discovery and figured out, oh, no, that's actually a wolf. He's what's called a psychopomp. He's an entity that guides souls of the dead to their afterlife. And he would weigh your heart against an ostrich feather. And that ostrich feather represented truth. So if your heart was deceitful, it would then fall into the mouth of this horrible creature called Amit, and otherwise, you get to go to have a nice ending. You know, you get to go to heaven or something like that. Awesome. Um, the abundance of Anubis statues in this area suggests that the tomb they are building is probably for a pharaoh. So probably Seti. Yes. Um, there is also a thought that this is not Thebes. This is really Giza. Because Thebes did not have pyramids, and you very clearly see a pyramid here. Oh, so the introduction, all of the introduction scene was comprised of composite shots, or practical footage with matte paintings, um, and the vis- uh, all the visual effects and all of that uh, were done by uh, Industrial Light and Magic, which was started by George Lucas. And I could kind of see that as you're going through. You can almost somewhat see some of the edges of things, Mm -hmm. but because of how they put things together, it it kind of flows right. I was really impressed because when you're seeing how they're doing the the Sphinx, you can see all those workers on there, but they were all just composited on there. It was so interesting. Let's talk about the characters that we start off with. We got Pharaoh Seti the First, Imhotep, and Anak Sunamun, which will heretofore be ASN. Because nobody really needs to go through that whole name. See that so many times, right? 
So Imhotep is actually a real person and he is not a bad guy in history. He was a doctor, a high priest, an architect, a scribe, and a royal advisor. His name means one who comes in peace. And he was a chancellor to Pharaoh Djoser in the 27th century, not uh, 27th century BC, uh, not of Seti in the 24th. So these two characters never met in reality. Right. Uh, he is one of the few non-royal Egyptians to be posthumously deified along with Amenhotep. So many times the pharaohs would become deified, they'd become associated with Ra and other gods, where um, in this case, uh, Imhotep actually became a god in his own right. Awesome. Just because he did so many awesome stuff. So for Seti I, there are no actual dates for his rule, but it is thought he ruled for about 15 years total. Mm -hmm. He was an excellent military commander and opened many quarries for new statues and obelisks, but he was overshadowed by his son, Ramesses II. There's no evidence of any violence on his body, by the way. Uh, there's a decapitation, but they assume that that was done by grave robbers, not by how he died. They think that he died of heart disease. So if you examine the mummy, he appears to be less than 40 years old. And in April of this year, actually, his mummy was moved to the National Museum of Egyptian Civilization, along with 17 other kings and four queens. So that's kind of wow. cool. Uh, I believe also that in the movie Prince of Egypt, there is a Seti character as well, and he is voiced by Patrick Stewart. And in 2006's The Ten Commandments, the musical, this actor redid his role as Seti. It's the same actor for both this and for Ten Commandments Musical. That's pretty funny. Yeah. I feel like So Seti is a pretty f prominent pharaoh. So it only is, you know, that, that proves this is why they chose him to be part of the story. Mm -hmm. ASN is a fictional character, but she shares the name with a real woman who lived in Egypt around 1348 to 1322 BC. She was the wife of Tutankhamun, who is also believed to be her half-brother, and he died at age 18. She's also the daughter of Nefertiti, which kind of goes along with what happens in this whole story arc, but not really. Yeah. Uh, there's lots of drama that surround her. Her father was also her father-in-law slash cousin slash uncle. I don't know. She died when she was about 26. I could, <laughs> I did a lot of research on her, and to be honest, I'm not even going to go into everything that happened yeah. with her marrying and whatever, but from what I understand, she was kind of shifty. I'm just going to say, if your family tree is more wibbly wobbly than the doctor's timeline, you're doing <laughs> something wrong. But another thing about ASN, let's talk about her costume because oh. this was always one of those things that I stared at the TV like, what, how is this, what is, I, I okay, how did they do this? Is this all body paint? Is this like a, a body suit with somebody? Like how, how is this working? So uh, it's a really clever how they used the pattern on her body. I'm still not really sure how it gets past the rating because um, you can pretty much see all of her chest. She probably was wearing something to cover herself though. I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna say, yeah, just for the fact that you brought this up in our notes, I was like, okay, let me look and see how they made this work. She's wearing pasties. They're, she's wearing nude colored pasties. Well, of course she, is. she that, has to be. And then it's all made out of just like fishnet mm -hmm. um, that is done in just the right pattern to match up with her body paint on her arms. How long did this take? Like, seriously, I've, I've watched shows about people being body painted. It probably took her forever to be in makeup. Impossible. She can't sit. Any of that stuff. Which the good thing is, is she's only in part of the movie, so they didn't have to always right. do that a whole, the whole And in, in the second movie, they clearly did away with the body paint mm -hmm. when they show her in the past. So, yes, <laughs> fine. So she probably didn't wear it every day. Mm -hmm. And a funny little bit of trivia, when uh, this was shown on planes, they actually gave her a digital bikini. <laughs> Very Princess Leia that, right? Yeah. <laughs> there is a cat statue in one of the scenes where... Uh, 
ASN basically leans up against a cat statue, and that is the goddess Bastet. And um, the the goddess Bastet was worshipped as a form of a lioness and later as a cat. She's the daughter of Ra, the sun god. Uh, Bastet was an ancient deity whose ferocious nature was ameliorated after domestication of the cat around 1500 BC. Her name is translated as She of the Ointment Jar, as she is depicted as a protector against contagious disease and evil spirits, just like most cats uh, in ancient Egyptian. She's later merged with Sekhmet, who is the warrior protector goddess with the lion head. So uh, initially Bastet was just cats, and then she got the lioness added on. There is a lot of weirdness with one god joining another god and becoming this and that in Egyptian mythology, primarily because it's politicized. Um, originally, Amun and Ra were two separate deities. And then, in order to get these two areas to work together, the pharaoh said, no, they're the same guy now. Okay. Yeah, they did that a lot. And while we were talking about her, ASN's costume, her, the way that Pharaoh realizes that someone has quote-unquote touched her is that part of her arm was smudged. And I gotta say, as we have already said, this, I feel, like, could happen at any time. She could, like, you know, accidentally budge some curtain or some piece of the yeah. wall or maybe someone just bumped her or... Maybe she had an itch. Yeah. <laughs> I don't but know. she has no excuses for it. Like, all she could have been like, yeah, I had an itch, or there was a fly on me. Something like that. Right. She just goes, oh my gosh. Yeah, well, maybe the. Maybe it was a thing where nobody was to touch her but Seti. But um, in the commentary, I found out that Summers actually added the shot of her getting smudged by Imhotep so that the audience would know that she was wearing body paint and it wasn't a costume. Um, I suppose it's so that she didn't seem supernatural, like she was some kind of goddess or something like that. So, gotcha. But in all practicality, in real life application, for her to have to be body painted every day of her life or whatever while she was in service to SETI, to me is like, why would you do that it to yourself? It is crazy, yeah. So there is, uh, let's talk about the language. The ancient Egyptian dialogue in the first two mummy films were reconstructed by Egyptologist Stuart Tyson Smith. And he also did uh, some of the stuff for Stargate as well. Yep. Uh, it is unknown how to properly speak and pronounce Egyptian dialects since the vowels were in hieroglyphics instead of being written out which makes total sense. It's a lot like Hebrew. Hebrew doesn't really show any of its vowels. They right. just kind of assume it based off of context. So a couple things with ASN before we move on. Uh, she does this sweeping eye cover thing. It seems to be like a thing between her and Imhotep where she just like covers his eyes with her hand and it's like, okay, what does this mean? Yeah. Any, I, any thoughts, discussions? I've got nothing. <laughs> I have no idea why she's doing that. You got thought? I didn't even remember that it happened. Yeah. Uh, one of the things that she says uh, when the guards kind of come after her, though, in this scene, is she says, my body is no longer his temple. Uh, referring to the, the pharaoh. And this may suggest that she is a Kadesha, or sacred prostitute. Uh, the, as their goddess, Kadeshu, was often depicted as riding a lioness f with a fistful of arrows. This links up with ASM. ASN attacking the pharaoh from beside the giant cat statue. Kadesha was also worshipped during the same time that the original person named ASN was alive. So the timeline actually isn't all that far off. That is very interesting. Okay. But now we're going to shift over, now that the pharaoh is dead, we're going to shift over to Hamanaptra in 1290 BC. And let's talk about Book of the Dead, because this is honestly its own little character, the Book of the Dead. Uh, the real life Book of the Dead is, and I am citing from what is called Rickopedia. It's a website of all things mummy if you want to check it out. Mm -hmm. uh, the real Book of the Dead is not a single artifact, but a funerary text which has countless copies in tombs across Egypt. The text was originally titled Book of Coming Forth by Day or Book of Emerging Forth into Light and contained narratives and spells that the deceased world 
that the deceased would need to successfully navigate the underworld and pass the judgment of Osiris. Since codices bound books with individual sheets of paper or pages, that's what a codice is, they had not yet been invented. The Black Book of the Dead was written on papyrus scrolls or carved or painted into walls of the tomb. But this book is made of obsidian, which is practically impossible in real life as obsidian is extremely sharp, but very fragile, especially in thin pieces. So of course, magic could have been used to shore up the book in the universe. And this is one other thing that I found is that this book doesn't just show up in these three mummy movies, well, mm -hmm. first two mummy movies. It also shows up in the Tom Cruise it does, one. It yeah. hides in the background in this archive, which suggests that it is also in the same universe. Yes. That is a big theory passing around the internet. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We also see five canopic jars. So this is what they use to put his vital organs in when you mummify somebody. Originally, there are only four jars. There's one with a human head, one with a jackal head, a baboon head, and a falcon head. And then in this film, we see that there's a fifth one, which is, has a lion head. That one is not historically accurate. They just added it. Mm -hmm. So when they're doing this mummification process, there's also the home dye, which is what they give to Imhotep. This is not a real curse. I yeah. mean, do I really have to say that? It, it's obviously not a real curse. Yeah. Um, and, and they start by cutting off his tongue. And I was like, is this the to the pain duel from Princess Bride? Like, we start by cutting off your tongue. And then we're going to cough your arms and your legs. And we're going to cough your ears. And cough your e we're going to cut off your eyes. But you're going to get your ears so you can hear. <laughs> In this case, it's we'll, we'll cut off everything but your teeth. Yeah, apparently. We'll get there. <laughs> uh, so then they cover the mummy in scarab beetles. In real life, there really are beetles that are indigenous to Egypt, known as scarabs, but they are not flesh eaters. Um, they are actually considered holy and were worshipped by the ancient Egyptians. Yeah. Which I guess is a good thing that there are no flesh-eating scarabs because that's just horrifying. Yeah, all of these scarab swarms we see in the rest of the movie is terrifying. So here's a point of discussion for us all. Why? Why did they give him the power to come back later? Why didn't they just kill him? I mean, yes. Without it, we would not have a movie. I get yeah. that. That's, that's you know, we, we can go without ever saying that right. in these movies. Without these stupidities, we would not have the movie. What I, what I feel like this is a, supposed to be a curse that keeps him conscious and in torment forever. It's not just a, well, you're, we're going to torture you a little bit and kill you. You're going to be in torment for the rest of eternity. Um, but then the problem is, if he gets out, all that pain becomes magic power for him. And actually, on a completely er different area of the world, a Japanese onmyoji is a kind of a sorcerer that creates spirits that work for them. And they had a, forbi a forbidden technique to create these by torturing animals to death. So this is very similar to that. We now phase into Hamanaptra in 1923. So same place, just bust ahead. Uh, the set was an old Portuguese fort that they had recreated for this. Uh, there are some magi. They like to hang out on the, horse the rooftop. Rooftop, no. <laughs> the Magi like to hang out on cliff tops on their horses. Mm -hmm. Basically, they just like to watch. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, they were an actual group of elite military police in ancient Egypt, but there is no evidence that they still are existing. So the original plan was to have the actors uh, tattooed from head to toe, but the the director, Stephen Summers, said that... Um, when they cast Odid Fares, the main magi, that they thought he was too pretty to cover up. And as he said, millions of women on the internet were grateful. I, my roommate in college had such a crush on this guy. He was like, oh, he's so gorgeous. And I'm like, really? No. <laughs> I was a Brendan Fraser girl. She was the magi girl. So, yes. Uh, we first meet Rick and Benny, and uh, they are fighting. And Rick's first words are, prenez-vous positions, which is in French for take your positions. 
This is the Battle of Hamanaptra between the Tuareg Braves and the French Foreign Legionnaires. Yes, this is a real historical battle that occurred, although I don't think it has anything to do with mummies. Correct. Uh, so the guns are a little weird here. Benny runs, but then he throws his guns as he's running. Okay. Um, uh, so many times in this movie, they just shoot, run out of ammo, throw the guns on the ground, and then grab more. Like, they don't keep their guns for later. <laughs> yeah. Now, especially during this position, I think a lot of them were using, like, black, not even black power rifles, but they were using something that you do have to really load. Like a musket. Yeah, yeah like they were uh, using right. muskets. And the only person that's using a reloadable gun is Rick. Mm -hmm. He's using revolvers, although he starts with with, with a musket. Right. So some of the French fighters have a purple or blue sash, and some have none. There's obviously a difference between the mm -hmm. differentiation there. Uh, there are also several moments during this battle scene uh, where the cameraman can be seen filming in the background a little bit. If you squint, mm -hmm. you can see them, and they were not taken out. We first learned that Benny is an opportunistic coward in this scene because he runs and shoots himself up in the ruins. Rick thinks he's going to get shot by some of the Tuaregs. And so then he starts to close his eyes. And I this is just a part where I really like because I always watch the horse in the front of the Tuaregs because he rears up and he looks genuinely terrified. Yeah. He's like, hey! Yeah, you can see him like twitching and, and almost foaming at the mouth. That's how scared he is. That that. Yes, that horse knows how to act. Yes. I, I believe that. Uh -huh. So there's this moment where the the sand starts to kind of spray up. Right. And they said that that actually was practical. Um, they didn't get into too much detail about how they did it, but they said they were ripping something out of the sand, so I'm assuming it was some kind of, like, a rope or cord. That's what it looks so like, So that yeah. they would rip it up and the and the sand would pop up. And, and then obviously there's the, the scene later that's CGI, but I just thought that was kind of cool that they yeah. kind of had a practical mm -hmm. that way. That really is. It. And then as he's fleeing the scene, the Medjai are up on the cliff again. They're like, the creature remains undiscovered. Really? Because this American just saw a screaming face in the sand, and he know you know, Americans love talking about stuff that we have no idea what's going on. <laughs> well, it's like, this is something weird I saw in another country. I'm going to make a whole bunch of theories about it, and all of them are completely wrong. Mm -hmm. Okay? And then, he just saw the lot of you just chilling up by the Circle Cairo, and he already knows strange things are afoot. He's going to talk about this. The the, the creature has been discovered. Mm -hmm. um, also, the Medjai just seem generally ineffectual. Like, they go out of their way to not kill anybody that needs to be killed. Right, yeah. Like, we, we are just observers. Mm -hmm. We'll kill you if we have to, but we are just observers. And, you know, you make that whole point about the Americans speaking, and we know this to be true because, you know, in the next scene, like, three years later... There he is in the jail talking about what just yeah. happened, right? All right, but before we get there, let's jump to Cairo. And this is three years later. It's now 1926, and we are at the Museum of Antiquities, and we see Evie. So this is the first time we see her. She is a librarian. She is putting books away. She gets up on the ladder. She does the ladder dance. Uh, the bookshelves fall down. We know the scene. We know the scene. It's hysterical, right? Although what you probably didn't notice is that the book that she was reaching for when she starts doing the dance and then she drops the book, it zooms out. The book is gone. Mm -hmm. It reshelved itself. Mm -hmm. What? Mm -hmm. If you look at the shot too and pause it, like where she's kind of standing on the ladder in between the shelves, you will see that it is obviously a male stuntman. Oh, oh wow. you can definitely see that it's a man. <laughs> yeah. Um, the other thing was when they when the bookshelves do kind of the domino drop that they do when she knocks them over. That mm -hmm. was done in one take. Nice. Yeah. So. I wouldn't want to reset that. No. That's a lot of books to reset. Yeah. That would take like hours to reset that. Uh huh. So then in comes the overseer of the Museum of Antiquities who starts yelling at her. And he's like, "Oh, when the Ramses destroyed Syria, that was an accident. But then there's this." Ramses II actually did trash Syria, but that was not an accident. Uh, he and the Hittites were constantly at war with each other. The Hittites were constantly reconquering areas of land in Syria. So he kept on re-reconquering those lands up until he made a peace treaty with them in 20, 1258 BC. So he also says, clean up this mishiver. And I said, well, that sounds very like... 
Hebrew to me, like a, like a, you know, a Hebrew term. Um, it is not a word in English, Arabic, or Hebrew. This is, there is an Arabic word that is mishifer, which means code. But there is also um, Yiddish mishugash, mm -hmm. which means craziness, and a Hindi word, mashiva, which is very close to this, meaning a mess. I would buy that one probably the, yeah. the most. Um, so then uh, we also learn, which I didn't, I had never caught in any time I watched this, that she has people that she calls to help, which is Abdul, Mohammed, and Bob. These are apparently her co-workers. <laughs> yeah, but we never see them. Uh, so let's talk about the Bembridge Scholars. Uh, I know in a lot of these these that we talk about, we're going to have some really great quotes, and there is a Bembridge Scholar quote that comes in later in the movie. But let's talk about these. These are uh, not a real scholar group. However, there is a Bembridge school on the Isle of Wight that is for boys. So she's trying to show up the boys. But I'm asking, why not just say Cambridge Scholars? Because Cambridge Scholars is actually a thing. Nah. Yeah, it, it, are they? Maybe they didn't want to have to deal with like actually saying a real name. I, yeah, maybe. Um, also, um, during the scene, she gets her hands on this map that's hiding inside of the key, and she handles it with her bare hands. Yeah, no. No scholar would do that. Close. I do framing. And if there is anything that's remotely damageable or old, I wear gloves for that sucker. Mm -hmm. And then she makes a reference to a cartouche, which is on the map. Uh, it is A cartouche is a carved tablet or drawing representing a scroll with a rolled up in the ends. And when they are writing in ancient Egyptians, the cartouche will surround a proper noun, specifically those of royalty. So it's like putting it in bold. Right. Uh, and then, of course, her boss subtly burns part of the map. Yeah, the, so the one part of the map that you actually Whoops. wanted. Whoops. Yeah. Now we are going to go to Cairo Prison. This is, uh, they filmed this in downtown Marrakech. And uh, <laughs> there's something I didn't notice in the background this time. There's a large hamster wheel with a man running in it. And I'm not exactly sure what's its purpose, but you can see guys like in front of the wheel, like grabbing something from it. Well, oh. I was looking at, there's actually two sets of wheels uh -huh. and each one has a prisoner, it looks like inside of it. Right. And then two guards that are outside of it. So either this is punishment or they're using them as a wheat mill. Mm -hmm. to make their own bread. Which makes sense. Yeah. So when you first see um, uh, Bernard Fraser, Rick, in prison, he's got the long hair, and both the director and the editor in the commentary said, hey, it's George to the Jungle. Of course it is. <laughs> <laughs> Jonathan comments during this scene that he wants to get a spot of Tiffin. Um, I know what Tiffin is, and it... <laughs> There is a place you can eat in, I think, Animal Kingdom that's called Tiffy's or Tiffin's or something like that. So a Tiffin is a light midday meal in Britain, and or it can be a cake-like confection of crushed biscuits from Scotland. Mm. Sounds yummy. When Rick hits Jonathan, he says, Casbah. Casbah. <laughs> Um, I don't think they had rocked the Casbah back then, no. but um, I did a little research, and so I was like, is this a reference to the Citadel in Algeria? Um, but that is really far across the top of Africa to Europe, to Egypt Yeah, to go there. I don't know what it is. I just thought it was weird that he said Casbah. That is weird. Um, so they take Rick to be hanged because he had a very good time. Well... Yeah, so here's what happened in this scene, poor Brendan Fraser. When he's hung in prison, he remembers being fully choked out and losing consciousness in this scene. Now, lest you think, oh, someone slipped up. This has happened before. On the set of Back to the Future 3, oh, yeah. when Marty McFly gets, quote-unquote, hung in front of the clock tower in the Old West, this also happens to him. I feel like this is something that y'all need to get, get on board with and not uh, choke out your lead actors. Well, actually, with um, in the case of this movie, um, Brennan Fraser kept told him to keep tightening it, so oh, it was wow. on Brennan. Oh, okay. yeah, it was part of the commentary. Also, there seems to be a lot of choking 
of Brendan Fraser in this movie. You keep on watching, the mummies will always go and grab his throat. True. They, they love to choke him out. I don't know why. <laughs> I, I'm not going to theorize as to why, because there's dark portions of the internet right. just for that. All right, now we're moving on to the boat. Uh, the men are playing cards, and it looks like the money used was recreated to look like the U.S. currency of the time period. So that's the table full of Americans that are also part of this whole treasure hunt thing. I like to think, though, that personally, I would be like Evie, sitting in the dark corner of the ship, reading my book next to the Campbells. You know? Like, that's yeah. probably where I'd be. I could see that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, it would be certainly a good way to get away from all those weirdos up at the front. Mm -hmm. So then Evie mentions that she wants the book of Amun-Ra. But, again, we have already talked about this. Books don't really exist in Egypt like that. They aren't books. They're scrolls. Mm -hmm. Or tablets. But not a book. So, again, this is a little factually inaccurate. Yeah. And... We see Benny again. Yay, this sleaze ball. But based off his conversation with O'Connell, it seems like he has ever since that point been running a racket where he will take people out to the middle of the desert saying he's going to take them to Hamanoptra and then leave them in the middle of the desert with all and take all their money with him. Oh. And that's his racket. But these guys are actually somewhat smart and they only paid him half at the front and half they're going to pay it half when they get back. Okay, so this makes a little more sense to me. When we get to the end of the movie, I want you to remind me of that statement because mm-hmm. now I have a better theory from what you said. Okay. All right, so further on with the uh, actor who plays Benny. So social justice warriors, not so fast. Don't be so quick to cancel Kevin J. O'Connor for playing Benny because... You might mistake Benny for actually being an Arab character, but he is not. According to the commentary, the actor, um, the character of Benny is actually Hungarian. Mm. So he's European. Um, so he's he's totally kosher for playing that role. Not exactly, not actually Hungarian himself, but the at, least he's, at least he's at least he's European and he's not playing. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, and you're going to see that a lot. Many times he says things that you might not necessarily understand what it means. He's actually speaking Hungarian. Right. And the name of the boat they're actually on is called the Sudan, which is also a country below Egypt. Um, And then, of course, Evie talks a little more about George Bembridge in 1865. I can't find anyone associated with the Bembridge School that is named George Bembridge. I've actually seen uh, tombstones of a George Bembridge but he has nothing whatever to do with the stool. Yes, I did deep dive that much. Um, it looks like there are pistols with six shots that are shooting more than six bullets in the scene when the fight breaks out. And you can watch this show very carefully. Every single time Rick pulls out his guns and he starts unloading them, he will every single time shoot 18 shots. Mm. These guns that he's using are the Shamalot Delveen model 1873 revolver and they have a six round drum so there is no way unless he's hiding a third one somewhere that he is shooting 18 shots Mm -hmm. every single time i don't know how he does it right so i have to give a little bit of context for this part but uh so evie has the oh no okay so somehow the magi has the key to the book of the dead um, I think he may have either gotten it from Evie or from uh, Jonathan yeah. when he's out in the hall. But when Jonathan goes to throw the Magi off the side of the boat, he then has the key again. So did he grab it from the burning Magi's pocket? Like, where did he get the key? It's not out of theme for this guy who's kind of a weasel to also be a pickpocket. Yeah, I can right. see Jonathan pickpocketing. Yeah, guy. he, he sure. totally was just like, swipe. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, once they're off the ship and they're on the land, it comes one of the best quotes, which is also random, but it's one of the best quotes, which is, uh, hey, Benny, you're on the wrong side of the river. Yeah, because Benny's, Benny's just sitting there like, oh, we got all the horses, we got the... You're on the wrong side of the river, you moron. So the river, quote in, in quotes, uh, was actually uh, a pond in England. So, yeah, a little... little little different there and yeah. um 
they actually had to digitally paint Evie's nightgown because it was completely see-through when she got <laughs> out of the river. Oops. <laughs> Whoops. Uh, now they are in the desert and they are, you know, accumulating camels and preparing to ride the camels to Hemenoptera, right? But, like, how much money do these people really have? Like, that they just lost everything. But somehow in their wallets, they have enough money for that, for her new clothes, for all of that. And earlier, she just offered 500 pounds to, to get Rick off free. What? How rich are these people? When uh, Rachel Weiss actually asked for her to have her eyes done like a belly dancer that she had seen for the more for when she changed her clothes. So the next time you see her when she's changed. Uh, so that was an interesting thing. Also, I need to ask, is sleeping on a camel actually possible? I researched, couldn't find anything. Right. I mean, I'd be afraid I'd fall off. Yeah, for sure. Um, also, I think because, and I don't know if I'd say this later, but uh, yeah, Evie is riding a side saddle, mm -hmm. which is hard. <laughs> um, and oh, look, the Magi are on the cliff watching them again. Yep. That, yep. Mm -hmm. So they're on their race to Hamanaptra. And Benny says, because he has now joined them, all the Americans, Benny says, patient, my good Barotem. Or it could be Baratem. And that's Hungarian for friend. Okay, so he is speaking Hungarian then. Yeah, like I said, Evie's riding side saddle, which I think is extremely athletic. And this, this whole race doesn't make any sense because horses are faster than camels by about five miles per hour on average. And camels hate racing. So <laughs> there's no reason the good guys should win. Stephen Summers in the commentary was actually talking about how m almost everyone got sick um, during the shooting, but Summers had learned on a previous movie that his uh, his digestive survival guide uh, for third world countries was mashed potatoes and chicken. So that's, that's what he ate. eats so he doesn't get sick? Yeah. That's funny. Once they have gotten a ham and after they are going to start the dig in two separate areas. So the Americans say... Their quote of the time is, they are led by a woman. What does a woman know? A lot more than you, buddy. Yeah. A lot, lot more than you. She, she's a librarian. She knows all the things. All the things. Um, although she doesn't take that knowledge wisely sometimes. Yeah. Uh, the statue that Rick finds is Anubis. So he's standing under the statue of Anubis when the weird things are coming out of the sand. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I, I really liked when uh, Rick kind of swings down into the tomb. That diagonal wipe was really cool. It followed him down into the tomb. It was really cool. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, and then the warden climbs into the tomb after him, and he climbs off the rope. He seems to be grabbing something invisible in his other hand. So, he's grabbing two things, and apparently there was, like, a wire connected also that the actors could grab onto and he was having a hard time so he grabbed onto it you can see him grab something invisible it's really weird yeah because really they edited it out digitally right and then uh there evie is talking about the saw net jer um, yeah. as a preparation room and the word literally means hall of the god it's a shrine associated to underworld gods mm -hmm. and as such yes it is used to prep monies okay Another little continuity error is that in the shot where they talk about, like, it sounds like bugs before the scarabs come, Rick is wearing a leather wrist guard on his wrist. He wears it for most of the movie. But in the next... So he, he it actually goes away in the scene, and then in the next scene comes back. Hmm. So I don't know if they forgot to put it on him or what. And then also, funny enough, Evie says... <laughs> this god is he who should not be named which i thought was funny i'm like voldemort reference this is really i mean both of them are kind of in a form a lich they, they preserve themselves by weird ways right. um but the thing is imhotep is a dude that has gone down in egyptology as a demigod i think somebody remembers his name so this whole point of he should not be named there's a point to that right like, especially because as we know imhotep just says his name all the time yeah yeah or his, his followers was emo dip, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, we're outside the ruins, and it's like further on that night, you know, the diggers have found their treasure that they have found. Um, it is a booby trap they have found in this tomb. It was salt acid, which is another name for hydrochloric acid. 
Although hydrochloric acid wasn't actually discovered until the 10th century AD by a Persian alchemist named Abu Bakr al-Razi. Right. I don't think the role of the R is there, but it's just fun to say. Right. Jonathan finds uh, a broken bottle of Glenn Livet, 12 years old. Um, 12 years old is not how old the scotch is. It is uh, the name of the brand, and it is a 12-year single malt scotch. It could be older than that, but it was 12 years when it was bottled. Right. Uh, however, Glenn Livet was established in 1824, so this is not really accurate for the time period that he would have found this mm. in, what is it? Oh, wait, maybe he would have. Because it's 1926? Yeah. yeah. Oh, never mind. Totally scratch that. Yeah. So it was established in 1824, so you're probably okay. Yeah. And then the Medjai just kind of show up and they kill a whole bunch of people. They set some tents on fire and they're like, you have one day to leave. Why? Why not now? Why? What? Is it just because there are people here that have plot armor? Is that the only reason why they have to, they, they have an entire day to mess around? Like, why? Maybe they have to unpack or pack again. That's awfully um, considerate for these people. Well, you know, they don't, don't kill know. people, so they, they're Except probably some kind unless, of... Unless they have no purpose in the plot. <laughs> they killed a whole bunch of Americans that matter nothing. Uh, Evie states a little bit about her family. Her father was a famous explorer, and when we watched the second Mummy movie, uh, we find out that his name was Howard Carnahan. Uh, he fell in love with an Egyptian woman who is Evie's mother. They had Evie and Jonathan, and then he and his wife died in a plane crash. So that's kind of interesting to me, especially because of a lot of the adventures that Evie and Jonathan have uh, kind of mimic a little bit of yeah. what is happening to their parents. I love Evie's dialogue in this whole scene where she says, what is a place like me doing in a girl like this? Because she's so drunk she can't speak. Or I may not be an explorer or an adventurer or a treasure seeker or a gunfighter, but I'm proud of what I am. I'm a librarian. Love that line. I need it on a t-shirt or something. <laughs> anyway, uh, after a little rest, they go back in the digs and uh, they find Emotep. They open up his little coffin or whatever, and there is a curse upon the chest. Yeah, because this, there's the separate chest that the Americans have found, and right. it's got the curse inscribed on it. Mm -hmm. And the inscription is read as, Death will come on swift wings to whosoever opens this chest. And it is a rewrite of the alleged curse of the pharaoh King Tut, uh, which read, Death shall come on swift wings to him who disturbs the peace of the king. So women could freely disturb Tut's tomb. Correct. I like the way he thinks. Correct. He was allowing the women to come in. There's a dude who's here. Death, swift wings. Um, some ladies have shown up. How you the one? <laughs> Apparently, he's Joey from Friends now. Apparently, I don't know. there are scratches on the lid of uh, Imhotep's sarcophagus. So we see when he was buried, though he was clearly bound in a mummy-like way. How how did he get free to scratch the beetles the inside the of the scarabs? Tomb? The scarabs might have torn away at his wrappings that's very possible and you know those wrappings they aren't going to last forever they're going to start getting brittle so eventually they're going to start falling apart so he was still alive when mm -hmm. the, okay there is a lion head jar we've talked about this before that's the extra one and that is the one that is broken so all the other four are intact but the lion jar is broken again the lion is being connected with sekhmet or bastet who protected from evil spirits so her jar being broken means no one is under any form of protection anymore uh yes okay now we're back outside again um another time for another rest this dig is taking forever um Evie wants to read the black book and she says no harm ever came from reading a book. Uh, this is incorrect in so many cases. In fact, so that our new t-shirt line, one of the t-shirts will say no harm ever came from reading a book. And as we're going through this whole series of 80s and 90s movies, we will prove to you that this is definitely wrong by making a t-shirt every time somebody reads a book. And something bad happens. Uh, almost every time you have a fantasy story and there's harm going on, it's because somebody read a book. 
especially when you read them out loud in their native tongue. Yes, that's a bad thing. So when Evie opens the book and the wind kind of blows her hair, if you look in the background, the tents in the background don't move at all. Yeah, it's just a little fan. Just Oof. just her personal windblown fan, mm. yes. Then comes their first plague. Okay, I'm going to say it's their first plague because we're going to talk about how Imhotep brings along the plagues of Egypt. Now, the problem is we do not get the plagues in the same order that they are in the Bible. So they are getting locusts, but the locusts are actually plague number eight in the Bible. As a fun fact, the only difference between a grasshopper and a locust is dopamine, which is the chemical in your brain that makes you feel happy. Once grasshoppers get too packed in one area, their body starts to generate dopamine, changes their body color, and then they start getting very angry and eating everything. And that is a locust. Weird. Okay. So maybe the reason why they're out of order is because Imhotep didn't have a Bible. Very true. <laughs> yeah, um, he, he, d he didn't have any reference materials. But as far as the production goes on this, uh, the locust swarm that you see, it was completely CGI. But... Uh, buckets of real locusts were dumped on the actor Jonathan Hyde. And he's the one who's holding the black book saying, what have we done? Yes. Uh-huh. Yes. Okay. That's, I, that's creepy. And so I it was, yeah, that was kind of a bucket, factor. bucket brigade of locusts, including the director was one of the people <laughs> dumping the locusts. <sighs> We are back inside the digs yet again, and uh, they're all running away because here come the scarabs. Um, but what's really weird is that, so Rick kind of used the fire to keep the scarabs away a little bit, but then he ends up throwing the fire off the side of the bridge instead of keeping it, because I'm pretty sure that it would have helped him keep the beetles away from them. Yeah. I don't know why he did this. Uh, then we see that the first American loses his eyes and his tongue. And when this is happening, I just start laughing because there's kind of this like rant, 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 rant music in the background that's happening. Very psycho. He, he lost his glasses also. This is an issue. So he can't see. He has no eyes, but he has no glasses either. So it doesn't matter. Well, Psycho was, I believe, and also yes, it was also a Universal movie, so there was no corporate infringement there. Right. Mm -hmm. So then Emmatep recognizes Evie as ASN, but as we know from the second movie, she really looks more like Nefertiti than a ASN. That's a little bit of a continuity miss. It's something like they didn't really think about that until yeah. later. And then the, they finally come face to face with the mummy and Rick just screams right back at him. So this is something that you also see very frequently in comedy horror movies. Whenever something bizarre starts making noises at you, you just yell right back at it to assert your dominance. Yeah, that's <laughs> going to work out well. Um, and then they get up to the front, up to the top, and they're, they're trying to leave now that the mummy is about. And... The Medjai show up and they're like, hey, we, we told you to leave. You didn't. And now this creature is free and you can't kill him. That's a memo you should have passed along a little <laughs> earlier. If you had been like, hey, you got to leave. There's an unkillable monster here and we're here to stop you. Yep. Oh. Yeah, I'll just hop on a bus. Right. Yeah, probably would have made a difference. When the mummy approaches Benny, uh, I, I think this part is hysterical, but I really wanted to see what it was that he was using to ward off uh, Imhotep. So here are his talismans. He uses a Christian cross, the Islamic crescent moon and sword, a Buddha, and a Star of David. But he is also wearing a Hindu symbol of Shiva, Lord of the Dance. And destruction. This was one of those that took me forever to figure out what it was. And I actually had Marshall help me with this research because I was like, I, I don't know. I'm looking at all these image searches and I can't figure out what this is. And of course, he found it. Yeah. Shiva is a purifier uh, who gets a little too into his job. And really only his wife Parvati can make him just shut up and do yoga instead. Mm. Um, and then at the end of this... Everybody is left, and you see the mummy's fist come up through the ceiling. And with all these very normal exits available, why did Imhotep have to punch his way through? Like, you could just walk. The, the Benny scene is one of my favorite scenes in the whole movie. Mm -hmm. Yeah. For sure. We're going to move on now, finally. <laughs> the dig is over. Uh, we're going to Fort Brighton in Cairo. Yeah, in the director's commentary, Summers reveals that he named the fort after a British character 
Colonel Bryden in his 1994 adaptation of The Jungle Book, played by Sam Neill. So it seems like Evie had been staying at Fort Bryden before because there's a lot of personal items here, including a cat. Um, so Rick comes to see her, and one of the funny things that I noticed, and apparently it was a deleted scene later on, is as Rick is leaving, he's holding a teddy bear in his hand. So people think that maybe he had given it to her or was trying to give it to her uh, in the scene, but like something happened and they just deleted the scene, so you don't really know what's going on there. Hmm. But then Rick goes to a bar in Cairo, um, the, and it kind of goes back and forth between that and the fort. Uh, there are a lot of plus-size... Plus prostitutes i guess in this bar like i think that's a really interesting representation of how in morocco you, you know you don't you have to be the skinny girl yeah. really so the, i really like the press the representation there then i also really love the part where jonathan's holding the key and uh the one guy comes up and rick just kind of like he just does this really subtle indication and jonathan puts it away like you know there was that communication that they had was kind of cool mm-hmm then we hit their plague number two, which is water to blood. This is actually plague number one in the Bible. And if you look at this, it is way too thin to be blood. It's almost like pink lemonade Kool-Aid. That's what it yeah. looks like. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then their third plague hits, which is hail. This is actually plague number seven. And the hail is really dry dog food painted white. Nah. Right. Uh, that sounds expensive. Uh-huh. We go back to the Museum of Antiquities because obviously these people need help. Uh, b- behind Jonathan is a chariot with a dummy furrow, which is very close to the one that we see Seti driving in the very beginning of this movie. And then they go in and they start talking with the head Medjai, as well as Evie's old boss, who is also a Medjai. Did anybody see that coming? Everybody saw that coming. Um, and they're blaming their failure on Evie and Rick. And it's like, no, this is entirely your fault because you did not talk to anybody. Yep. You didn't kill who needed to be killed. Um, and then they, and during the conversation, they're saying cats are the guardians of the underworld. Egyptology fail. The cats ward off evil spirits and pests. And that is why Imhotep is afraid of them because he is an evil spirit. The guardian of the an- the guardian animal of the underworld is the African golden wolf. Oh, right. Which is why Anubis has an has that wolf head. Oh, okay, makes sense. So their fourth plague shows up, which is darkness. This is actually plague number nine. Um, and I would have to say here that Jonathan really knows a lot of Bible verses, like verbatim. It's kind of weird for a drunken gambler. Correct. Yeah. And then they decide, okay, well, let's lock her in her room while we go do a whole bunch of things. Why do these bedroom doors all lock from the outside whenever there is this white male protagonist that wants to protect? Yeah, we were having this discussion about this, and I've noticed that in a lot of movies and uh, whatever, if there is a key that is used to lock a door that's in the in like an inside room, that key can lock the door from both sides. So if you take the key away and you're inside the room, you're locked inside your room. This might be a bad design flaw. I'm just thinking. Yeah. Yeah. But we're still at the fort, and we are in the Egypt- Egyptologist room. Benny says, uh, "Piskas a lock." Which is uh, Hungarian for filthy animal or turd. Yeah. Apparently is the literal translation. And we hear of their fifth plague, which is flies. This is actually plague number four. Then we go back to Fort Bryden and we're watching Evie and she has one of the Americans protecting her. And she's just asleep. She just like after screaming and yelling and pounding on the door within a few minutes, she just goes, "Eh, I'm going to go take a nap now. (laughs) And then Rick kind of comes in the door after the mummy is there, and uh, he does it with both hands. But then all of a sudden, the cat shows up. He's holding the cat. So uh, where did that cat come from if he used both his hands to open the door? Like, was Jonathan holding it behind him or something? Catapult. Right. Catapult. Got it. (laughs) Haha. All right. Now they're going back to the Museum of Antiquities because they need to find the other book. Um, but the crowd and Emotep have followed him. They are chanting and they have boils. This is their plague number six. This is actually plague number six. Um, 
They got it right once. Yeah, they got it right. Um, one of the Americans say last but not least when they are talking about the plague. Well, this is incorrect. There are still four more plagues they do not show specifically. Uh, frogs, which is number two. Gnats, which is number three and could have possibly been, been in the whole scene with the flies. Pestilence, number five. And the death of a firstborn, which is number ten. Mm. So, no, not last. Uh, yeah, maybe we're kind of going into that in the next movie. Maybe. And this is also the scene where Evie says, take that, Bembridge Scholars. So when they go back, they're, 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 in order to get this book, they have to go to the statue of Horus. Uh, Horus was the falcon-headed god of kingship and the sky. Uh, Horus was always fighting with Set or Sutek, uh, the god of everything you don't want coming to dinner, and the two of them would always be trying to protect the soul of the pharaoh as he's going through the afterlife. Outside in the street, Jonathan is uh, kind of meandering along with the other uh, zombies, but he's totally doing the Walking Dead guts cover up in this case, where he's just like, Emo Dev, you know, like mm -hmm. next to him. And I'm like, oh, they do that on Walking Dead. Um, and then he's like doing this whole speech, and Benny is there as an interpreter. And <laughs> Evie actually corrects Benny's grammar on Ancient Egyptian, and she's like, no, he actually said this. We don't need you. Nothing Cut. shuts down a villain like correcting their grammar during their big evil speech. Right. It's something I want to do in a D&D &D campaign. Like, have the BBEG just sit there and have this whole speech with a huge grammar thing in there mm -hmm. just so that I can see if the players will catch it. We're going to move on now to the Royal Air Force Base in Giza, out in the middle of nowhere. Some planes and some goats. That's awesome. The, there at the Fort Air Force Base is an antique biplane. Um, it is supposedly a de Havilland DH-82 Tiger Moth. It was used during the Sandstorm sequence in this film. But it, fun fact, it's also the same that was used by Indiana Jones and Henry Jones Sr. to escape a Nazi dirigible in Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. Very interesting. So, yeah, when, that's the scene where the dad shoots out the tail of the plane. Oh, okay. Yeah. And then the pilot, Winston, is kind of sitting there, and he's got a servant holding an umbrella on the wrong side. So the, the servant is on the right-hand side. The sun is from the left-hand side. So the shadow that's being cast by the umbrella is not hitting Winston at all. Benny and Evie are caught up in the sandstorm with Emotep. Uh, it was kind of a cool to find out the way they in the movie it looks like they get launched out of the uh, the, the sand tornado what they actually did is they had the stunt people on giant swings well not giant swings but swing like a swing set and then they just jumped off the swings and that's how they got <laughs> that's funny them. and when the plane flies overhead too like Evie's on the ground and she says O'Connell and then it shows the plane the numbers on the side of the plane are backwards. So they had flipped the shot. They had flipped it. Mm -hmm. And so she spins it around, and to try and save Rick, she kisses Imhotep. Wouldn't a, a kick to the gonads be more effective? Maybe. It would probably put him on the ground for a while. I mean, he's regenerated these by now. Um, also, the, the plane goes down, and bad luck, it goes down in quicksand. Except quicksand requires water to form. So what's it doing in the desert? Yeah. Maybe it's an air pocket. Who mm. knows? It's magic. So um, the one thing I wanted to note here about Benny. So Benny is uh, kind of similar to uh, the great Peter Lorre's role in a lot of the movies where he's kind of like mm -hmm. the kind of creepy right-hand man of the villain. And he also uh, functions kind of like Renfield in Dracula where he's yeah. kind of like the servant of the, the villain, the evil supernatural villain. Once they finally get to Hamanaptra, we are in the last part of the movie here. Uh, the one of the rooms where Rick and uh, Jonathan go down into reminds me of National Tre Treasure because there's so much gold in the room or whatever. Evie it wakes up on a sacrificial table and there's a rat crawling on her. Ugh. That is a real rat. And the look on her face is genuine because she's genuinely terrified of that rat. Also outside, there is a huge group of camels, and uh, they didn't arrive with camels. Yeah. So either A, these are the camels that they left there the last time, 
or B, these are the camels, as we were talking about before, Benny is running this mm-hmm. scheme. Maybe these are the camels that have, like, um, accumulated from all these groups that Benny just leaves out in the desert. <laughs> like, Possibly. Maybe they're there. I don't know. Rick comes up and cuts Evie's chains on the sacrificial table. Apparently a sword can cut chains now. Hey, it's fantasy story. He's the fighter. <laughs> okay. Uh, there is a mummy without legs that is really reminiscent of the zombie without legs in The Walking Dead that's kind of like crawling along the ground. She opens the Book of the Dead and throws away the key. Why? Why are we throwing things away in this movie? I, I don't know. But like the Book of Amun-Ra and the the Book of the Dead both get thrown away at the same time. Like they They're all just thrown into the Black Lake. But then we find out that one of the two of them gets recovered in the next movie. Right, because uh, ASN also goes into Black Lake. So I think she comes out when she reincarnates and they they do the dig. She knows where it is and they find it. Yeah. So now uh, everything is done. They are outside the dig site and they're leaving. And Evie gets up on Rick's camel. And I know this is super romantic and everything, but why isn't she on her own camel? Like, isn't this really uncomfortable that you're sitting on someone's lap? On a camel? We already know she she's yeah. fully able to drive the camel herself. Yeah. Okay. There are quite a few camels there, and at least three of them have saddles that I can see. So I don't get it. Is it a coincidence that Rick chose the camel with the treasure, or do you think he sought that one out? The Just a little bit of, from the commentary about that that I remember. That is actually the camel that Benny loaded. Right. So that's the treasure that he loaded. He wanted to make sure. He said some people didn't seem to realize that when they watched the movie, but that's what it is. Right. Yeah. But what we're trying to figure out is, did he go, huh, that one's got treasure on it. I'll take that one. Or, uh, we're talking about um, Rick. Rick. Yeah. Rick sees the treasure and gets on that one, or he gets on the camel and then later finds out, oh, it's got lots of treasure on it. I would say he saw Mm -hmm. the the treasure. Yeah. And Evie has to do all of this in a nightgown. Like, all of this. Yikes. Yeah. Um, I also love when Jonathan tries to kiss the camel, and the camel's like, no. I'm <laughs> not into this. Glenn livid on his breath. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Oded Fair uh, apparently charmed his way. He's the one that's the... Uh, the, the main me- magi. The, the yeah. main magi, yeah. Apparently he charmed his way into surviving the movie because the script had him being killed by all the mummies in the right, corridor. Right, because he goes down, yeah, he goes down the hallway and, and you think he's dead. And then all of a sudden he shows up at the end. Yay! Yeah. Which I think he's in the second movie as well. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah, his character was, was very popular. Way to go. So if, if you're an aspiring actor and you want to survive a movie, charm the socks off of the crew. That happens a lot. The crew. Mm-hmm. Well, thank you so much for sticking with us on our first uh, episode of Can't Find Nostalgia. We do have another one coming in a few weeks. We're excited. We won't tell you what it is yet, but it is coming. Um, So we hope you stick with us for this part. So thank you for listening to Elated Geek. Follow us on social media for pictures and more info on things we talked about in today's podcast. You can find Lainey on at Zany Lainey or me at One True Hazard. You can also find at Elated Geek on our Instagram, and you can also find Elated Geek Tweets on Twitter. If you want to go to a website, we have www.elatedgeek.com. Links for these are in the show notes. If you want to help us to continue to bring you new and exciting things to nerd out about, please consider donating to our coffee account. The link is in the show notes, and every donation is accepted with total appreciation for your support in us. Send us your geek obsessions or topics that you want us to experience and talk about in future episodes. Email us at share at elatedgeek.com. And until next time, geek out.